Debunking Eco-Justice Climate Kids Court Case Part 4, Gen Climate Action, a copycat court case of Juliana and James Hansen. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society, and we're going to continue our discussion of the recent court case uh, led by Eco-Justice and a group of young people against the Ontario government. So this is the fourth and final part of this um, series and we'll be talking about some of the background elements um, and uh, foreign interference as I see it in this whole thing. So um, there's a court case in the States with the granddaughter of James Hansen and that seems to have been sort of the spark for all these uh, Gen Climate Action Kids cases. So let's go through and see what things I found and see what you think about them. And I want to say one thing, especially if there are some young people watching, I am not trying to hurt or embarrass anyone who's associated with the case. Obviously people truly believe what they're standing up for and I respect that. At the same time, I'm very concerned, and so are all of us at Friends of Science, that young people are unnecessarily afraid of doomsday. Um, you know, this concept of maybe only having 12 years or 8 years or 5 years has been deeply embedded in a lot of propaganda, and that's simply not true. So I hope that I'll give you some insights into what's going on from our perspective. And I hope that I'll give you some hope and maybe some opportunities to look at other perspectives on climate change because there is a whole spectrum of dissent, dissenting views on climate change. And in a democracy, in a democratic society where we have open civil debate, we should be able to respectfully hear and assess and counter the points that other people make. So have a look at what I found and um, we'll see you in the comments section. So kids, yep, kids. So we find here's um, Severn uh, Kala Suzuki who was at the Rio conference in 1992. Uh, Felix Finkbeiner of Germany who also spoke to the EU uh, Parliament, I believe. He started a tree planting enterprise. Here's the angry kid that Greenpeace ran in 2007. We don't know who he was related to. Um, then, of course, we have Greta with our houses on fire and uh, the Calgarian Greta, Sadie Vipond, and uh, Martha et al the Gen Climate Action case, and there's also another case, La Rose et al. versus the Canadian government, which is led by Eco-Justice. So many kids going to court these days, um, kind of a Joan of Arc thing happening, it seems. And Eco-Justice presents it as schooling politicians on climate, and these young people are presumably doing that. Now if you recall, about 30 years ago, global warming became front page news with this gentleman, James Hansen. And now, in the United States, he and his granddaughter are taking the United States to court. Um, so it's really something to have such a famous person as your guardian. Um, but in fact, the courts are having trouble dealing with these kind of claims. Uh, the, the statement is where there's a legal right, there's also a legal remedy unless there isn't. And so the remedial powers of an equity court are not unlimited. And these are kind of some of the reasons why uh, some of the cases in Canada have been thrown out and gone back to appeal. Because um, Sometimes it's because they're trying to make judgments on forward things that haven't happened yet. So uh, it's hard to um, have a court judgment on something that's theoretical in the future. 
Now, you may not know, but um, climate action dates way back to 1988 in Canada. And there was the Toronto Climate Conference. And of course, James Hansen was there. And he testified that greenhouse warming had begun. And this gentleman, Stephen Lewis, was Canada's ambassador at the time. And of course, his famous um, children uh, are uh, Avi Lewis and his wife, Nomi Klein. So they're carrying on the family tradition. It's rather disturbing to read this PBS Frontline interview with Senator Timothy Wirth, who was part of James Hansen's presentation um, in, the, uh, in the U.S. to Congress. Um, it says here that in the interview they're saying, what, what was happening that summer? What was the weather like? Well, believe it or not, we called the Weather Bureau and found out what historically was the hottest day of the summer. Well, it was June 6th or 9th or whatever it was. So we scheduled the hearing for that day. And bingo, it was the hottest day on record in Washington or close to it. It was a stifling hot that summer. That, at the same time, you had drought all over the country. So the linkage between the Hansen hearing and the drought became very intense. But that's not all that happened. And did you also alter the temperature in the hearing room that day? What we did is we went in the night before and opened all the windows, I will admit, right? So that the air conditioning wasn't working inside the room. And so that when the hearing occurred, there was not only bliss, which is television cameras in double figures, but it was really hot. So Hansen's giving testimony. You've got these television cameras back then heating up the room. The air conditioning didn't work. It was sort of a perfect collection of events that happened that day with the wonderful James, Jim Hansen who was wiping his brow at the witness table and giving this remarkable testimony. So that's a little bit of what we call street theater. Um, he may have been testifying, but in fact, it looks like people contrived it to make it appear a visceral experience rather than a factual experience. Uh, so I think that people should keep that in mind because this kind of chicanery, when you're talking trillions of dollars in climate policy and people's lives and their mental health, uh, this is not something that should be acceptable in um, free and democratic society that deals with evidence-based materials for making policy decisions. So we also find in his book, which was very popular, Storms of My Grandchildren, well we find that he made a little mistake and um, this is one of the things that has scared lots of people, that the idea that the oceans, the tropical oceans, could be boiling within 500 years. Now this excerpt here is from a new book that he's writing, and he's been sending out email drafts of chapters, and he said that physical state is not possible on a 500-year time scale. That sentence should be eliminated or altered. But now you have millions of people who have read it, and they are convinced that it's true and that within 500 years we'd have boiling oceans. No, it's more like in 4 billion years or something like that. And another disturbing thing is that Enron knew. If you go back and look at the history of Enron, which was a very uh, powerful, very famous company in the United States that basically it um, became known as, I think, the sixth top company in the United States. They had excellent people working with them, but they had a lot of people fiddling around with the accounting books. And around the year 2000, it kind of blew up and disintegrated into a pile of ashes due to um, improper accounting practices and off-books accounting. But they actually are the root of the global warming push in North America, the push for cap and trade, and the push for a carbon price. And apparently, according to this article, they enlisted James Hansen, 
who the scientist who more than any other is responsible for bringing the possibility of climate change catastrophe to the public was among the scientists Enron commissioned. Now um, you'd have to go back and ask Lawrence Solomon for the details of that but just prior to um, James Hansen becoming involved in the catastrophic view, he actually had said that the major difficulty in accepting the theory of AGW has been the absence of observed warming coincident with the historic CO2 increase. And this is the reference for that. So in terms of Canada, we find that uh, through the Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, James Hansen influence from the United States has been interfering in our policies here. Now I don't know that that's anything particularly illegal, but it's uh, certainly something that Canadians should be aware of. So here he wanted people to sign this petition, uh, petition 297, which is to have the carbon uh, tax and dividend program a steadily rising price on carbon dioxide through a tax or fee on fossil fuels. The fee would make alternatives to fossil fuels cost competitive and spur investment and innovation. And so this is, uh, of course, sponsored by Kathy Orlando, who is the uh, National Director of the Citizens Climate Lobby, which is also associated with Greta Thunberg and her uh, association with the We Don't Have Time Foundation out of, Swiss, uh, out of Sweden and they are uh, pushing for carbon markets. And another email from James Hansen to Canadians, this was in May 2020 and he's saying that for more than a decade we've searched the world for a nation to demonstrate the one carbon pricing approach that would work, a rising carbon fee collected from fossil fuel companies with the funds distributed uniformly 100% to the nation's citizens. 80% um, of the public would come out ahead. Their monthly dividend would more than offsetting increased prices of fuel and products. Wealthy people with big carbon footprints would lose money, but they can afford it. And this money must be given to the public openly as a bank deposit, debit card deposit, or check, not hidden in some complex calculation in additional income tax forms. So, um, we are the experimental country, I guess. We're the ones living James Hansen's dream and the dream of other carbon trading uh, philanthropies in the world. Some of those big green ENGOs that I was telling you about in my earlier presentations on this topic. Um, and to me, the question is, did we know that we were being influenced in this way by foreign actors? And is this appropriate for Canadians? Especially now, many people are suffering under the burden of carbon taxes. Now we're going to put on a clean fuel standard as well. So these ever-rising costs are not things that Canadians chose. These are things that were um, infiltrated and, and foisted upon us through foreign-driven policies. Uh, let's go on. So the other thing that he then got into is an e-petition to raise Canada's carbon tax to $210 a ton by 2030. So this is that e-petition here and in it they're saying Canada's federal backstop carbon pricing policy is similar to the carbon fee and dividend solution as recommended by 27 Nobel Prize winning economists, climate scientist Dr. James Hansen and Citizens Climate Lobby. And they say that uh, based on modeling by Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, which is now known as the Canadian Climate Institute, shows that Canada must increase the price of carbon to $210 per ton <clears throat> by 2030. Well, we rebutted the uh, Ecofiscal Commission reports. But uh, this may pop up at some point. We may end up paying this because of this petition. Is that something you want? Did you vote for that? <coughs> it's 
excuse me. So this is a TED talk that James Hansen gave. And he's saying why I must speak out about climate change. And here he's referring to G Venus being extremely hot <clears throat> and saying that it was kept hot by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But in fact, Venus is a poor analog to Earth. Now even the World Economic Forum likes to pretend that Venus was once like Earth. Venus was once Earth-like, but climate change made it uninhabitable. Well, I wonder how many SUVs there were on Venus. These researchers, very recent researchers, write that except for size and mass, Venus compares poorly with Earth in many aspects. Its current heat transfer and thermal evolution are disconnected from behavior on Earth. Venus, with its 90 bar atmosphere, is a poor analog to Earth. Its high temperatures do not show that ppm concentrations of CO2 on Earth cause global warming. So they also say, we propose that global warming on Earth is connected with solar regulation of the ocean temperature and the measured correlation of CO2 with global temperature is due to a warmer ocean releasing more of its dissolved gases. So that's quite different from what James Hansen has been saying and what, from what Al Gore has been teaching. So Hansen is disputed on climate change. How can he be right on carbon tax and dividend? And how is that science? Why is he getting into the economics? And Canadians should know that foreign funding in 2005 to the Sierra Club under Elizabeth May, set the groundwork for a carbon tax. So this came from the Oak Foundation. They granted 217,893 US dollars <coughs> to the Sierra Club. And the purpose was to provide overall coordination of Canadian NGOs working on climate change in Canada. To have greenhouse gas emissions classified as pollutants under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and to create and administer a climate change action fund. So that's why you're paying a carbon tax. And I just want to remind people that back in February of this year, there was a hint of suspicion that there was foreign influence and foreign money in Canada behind the Freedom Convoy. Now, whether you like the Freedom Convoy or not, the fact is that individuals were debanked for very many nominal sums of money, minimum sums of money, whereas here we have very large sums of money. This was part of, apparently, the Tar Sands campaign, coming into Canada with the express purpose of changing Canadian policies outside the democratic framework. So just think about that as we go through this. So we find in the States, this group called uh, Our Children's Trust is actually backing, um, in some way, we're not sure how, this other youth versus government case that EcoJustice is fronting called La Rose et al. versus the Crown. Now it says here the plaintiffs are supported by Our Children's Trust and the David Suzuki Foundation, a leading Canadian environmental non-governmental organization, as well as the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation, an educational partner using this lawsuit to train the next generation of public interest lawyers. Well, what of the real public interest? Jobs, the economy, affordable, reliable energy. Isn't that what we should be training people to think about? And coincident to all this, we see that the Suzuki Foundation is pushing the eight to 18 to 8 campaign asks, could lowering the voting age help save the planet? And the campaign suggests that lowering voting age to eight 
would ensure climate change is a top priority for voters in October's federal election. So that was in 2019. But just today, this individual is tweeting um, his article in Toronto Star laying out the reasons why 16 and 17 year olds should be able to participate in federal elections. And the Right to Vote at 16 Act is facing a critical vote in Parliament. So older, wiser, tax-paying citizens question climate policies, whereas school kids were indoctrinated in the 3% program of outdated Al Gore climate science, and now various groups are pushing for 16-year-old voters. And perhaps you're curious why the media echo whatever the ENGOs say. Well, this appears on the Boothroyd Communications site, and they say that they helped the Strathmere Group, which includes Greenpeace, Pemina Institute, World Wild Fund Canada. It's actually about 11 of the top um, ENGOs in Canada. In 2014, we planned and facilitated the Toronto Skills Building Workshop Campaigns and Communications 2014 where directors from Canada's 12 leading environmental organizations learned from leading market researchers, journalists, and organizers and agreed to work on shared frames and messages in advance of the 2015 federal election. And then Parker Gallant writes in his blog, he reveals that the Strathmere Group have over 358,000 members, 420 staff, and annual budgets totaling over $50 million. So that's quite a bit of influence. Did you know that that was happening? Did you know that happened? That would be an indicator as to why the media play along with the environmental groups, why none of the media actually cover any dissenting views, and why the best they can do when they're assessing Professor William Van Wingarden's work is to call him a client change denier because they've eaten up all this indoctrination by these very wealthy groups, most of whom got wealthy because they are tax subsidized charities, so they are living off your money. And not only that, most of them also get a substantial amount of revenue directly from the federal provincial and municipal governments, more of your money. And I would say that as we've seen with pipelines and resource projects like Tech Frontier, these guys are not acting in the interests of Canada's economy. And most of them are also foreign funded. So I have many questions and I think that you should have some too. And I've shown this in a previous uh, video, so I won't go into it in detail, but this foreign funding is leading to the blocking of pipelines, jobs in the economy, and the clogging of courts. So, you know, every time uh, one of these groups takes uh, a level of government to court on any topic, you are paying for the government's lawyers. And sometimes they actually lose in court. Uh, but usually, if they win, even on appeal, they often ask for uh, costs as well, and they're often awarded costs, and you pay for that too. So let's consider this, that youth court cases actually violate ch charter rights. So how can a dependent youth hold any other view than their activist parent? Uh, we have the fundamental freedoms of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media. But, you know, if you are, um, if you're a child living, or a young person, a teenager living at home with a climate activist parent, a parent who calls people like me and uh, the rest of us at Friends of Science climate deniers who wants people like us thrown in jail. I mean, are you ever going to be able to bravely raise your head and say, hey mom and dad, um, I'm not sure I agree with you on this climate thing. Can we talk? Like, do you think that that person would be able to remain in their household? I, I doubt it. 
I really doubt it. Uh, and I think that it would be, um, you know, also a big identity crisis to pull away because these things are deeply embedded in people's psyche and they are often also part of their network of friends uh, and uh, relationships. So just like some kind of addiction, you know, pulling away from that group is very difficult and more so if you know that you will be treated like uh, the scum of the earth for having a dissenting view. And that, in my view, is wrong and a contravention of the Charter rights. So it's difficult to change your mind once you've taken a high-profile public stance. And adults have put these young people in the position of making themselves high-profile spokespeople for a certain point of view. Now, one thing that's quite interesting is this book, The Work of Festinger et al. And this is about when prophecy fails. And he looked at a number of apocalyptic groups and found that often when the prophecy fails, people cling tighter to the prophecy, perhaps because it's such an integral part of their identity. But as many people know, all of the climate change prophecies have failed. So we have this psychological factor that's working against having an open civil debate. And the other thing is simply that once you are a high profile person, especially if you're a young person and subject to peer pressure, it's unlikely that you would be willing to modify your stance or to look at other insights, say other insights on climate change. But you know, Michael Schellenberger did it. And why did he do it? Well, because after a critical review, he now believes that climate change is not a major problem and that it isn't even our most serious environmental problem. And he was a, an activist since he was about 14, I think. Um, he was active in saving the redwoods and very uh, active on the climate and environmental front. But he wrote a book to fully explain his change in stance because he couldn't stand to see his daughter and her friends despairing over having no future due to contrived fears about climate change. So it is possible to modify your view and to um, have a better understanding of climate change and perhaps not fear it. Instead, enjoy studying the science and enjoy listening to different perspectives. Let's move on. And really, you know, we often talk in society about diversity, inclusion, tolerance, and we talk about the spectrum of people's uh, views, but we never allow for the spectrum of dissent or the spectrum of different views on climate change. So these are just some that we drew up as examples, but you know, there's some people who are unconcerned about climate. They have other big concerns that they're worried about. There are some who are concerned about pollution more than climate. There are some concerned about the human impacts on climate, and some concerned about climate and pollution, but they want to see a cost-benefit analysis. There are some who are worried about climate change, but they find the messages confusing and contradictory. Like, why does Al Gore fly so much? If there was warming and cooling before, how is this different? And some are really angry that they think the economy matters over climate and the future of the planet. Like, what about my kids? And some are literally terrified of a climate apocalypse. They might decide to go vegan, not to have children, not to drive, or they might engage in some other sacrifice to save the planet. So if we're willing to look at uh, diversity in every other part of life, we need to be able to look at climate diversity too. And I want to point out to you that in 2015, EcoJustice called for an honest debate on climate, and we offered one, and all we got was silence. So we asked Margaret Atwood of Penn to stand up for freedom of speech, for our freedom of speech. Um, and she's an honorary director of EcoJustice. Well, silence. So ask yourself is, if EcoJustice is really arguing for charter rights and freedoms. And 
for all the young people watching or people who might have been suffering from fear of climate change, I would say, first of all, be prepared and not scared. And I mean, be prepared for extreme weather events. And there are ways that you can prepare for that uh, because these events happen and we have very good forward warning of them now. <clears throat> so, you know, every city and every uh, uh, emergency management group has ideas for how to prepare an emergency kit. Let's say there's a wildfire, let's say that there is, um, you know, there might be uh, a flooding in your area, might be related to spring flooding, there might be a big snowstorm that would cut off power or gas, or a big storm like we saw Fiona on the coast there. You know, either there would be evacuation orders and then you should have a kit that you can just throw in your car and get out of there, make a plan with your neighbors if you don't have a car so that they could help you get farther away from that area and um, you know make a kit for at home what happens if the power goes out or you don't have gas you know do you have some candles um, do you have a safe place to light matches do you have flashlights do you have some food that you can just open cans of food and eat that for three or four days some water on standby these things are all listed in these emergency kits so that will help when these you know occasional extreme weather events happen and otherwise I mean we can look at what we've done in society we've built a society that is quite um, resilient you know people don't realize that insulation in housing paving roads having street lights having pumped sanitation these are all climate change adaptations these are all things that have made it possible for us to live in extreme conditions. So human beings are quite good at that and we can get better at it. So don't be afraid. And this is from Hans Rosling's book, Factfulness, which I recommend everybody read because it's such a great book. But he said, you know, fear plus urgency leads to stupid, drastic decisions with unpredictable side effects. So when people are blasting on about the climate emergency, Remember that there's no emergency. The emergency was based on the RCP 8.5, um, which is an implausible scenario, and we do have time. And, you know, remember that places like the Alberta Securities Commission and your bank will be putting out red flags of investing fraud. Well, these are the same kind of red flags um, that you will hear about various climate policies you know there's no risk that it's uh, going to be tax free or that it'll be it'll be free it's a great investment opportunity your friends can't be wrong you'll have lots of profits don't miss the opportunity get in now you know that's the emergency part do it now so these are all signs that someone doesn't want you to stop and think about it they want you to simply jump on the bandwagon and these are not good decisions. These lead to drastic decisions with unpredictable side effects. So don't fall for it. Think twice. And again, I invite you to have a look at our youth-oriented bilingual uh, climate site. It's called Climate Change 101. And there's lots of information there in plain language. And there's a little bit about us. I've talked about us before in our other videos on this topic so I won't go on about it <clears throat> but I will ask you if you like the work that we're doing if you would consider donating $20 um, for our 20th year and helping us continue with our work you can just send an e-transfer to contact at friendsofscience.org or you can go on our main website and you can donate or you can join us as a member then you'll get our newsletters and you get all the news that the mainstream media never covers. Um, and again, I want to thank you all for watching the video. Thank you for the comments that you post below. And to any of the young people watching, really, I think if you read some history books like the ones I recommended before, uh, The Great Warming and The Little Ice Age by Brian Fagan, you know, it really gives you a rich sense of history and the things that humankind has gone through
through a warming period, through a cooling period, and that we managed to survive and that we came up with many good adaptations. Um, I have to say that today, because of the two Nord Stream gas pipelines being blown up in Europe, to me that sends a signal that all of us will be facing very difficult times ahead because there's an extreme shortage of energy in the world. Um, so life will not be quite as easy or fun as it was in the past 20 or 30 years. So I think we have to be prepared for difficult times and we have to look forward with hope, with hope. And I, I hope that you uh, will get some hope from some of the things that we have said and shown you that the future is not apocalyptic. The future is an adventure. And even if it's an, a difficult adventure that stands before us, it's ours to face with courage and innovation and, and joy because we have life. It's in our hands. So let's choose life and let's go forward with joy and hope and optimism. And um, let's not concern ourselves with climate catastrophe thinking. Thanks very much for watching. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.